Hey, y'all doing? Donald back here again, and today I'm going to lift the veil on the mystery that is the context package. Um, context package kind of confused me as to what its purpose was when I first saw it, and it took me. It wasn't until like more recently that I really kind of got a better grasp of what it's for. So essentially, what it's for is, and you'll mostly see this in relation to like 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 HTTP servers is. It allows you to carry across through an entire like uh, process that would be started from like a, something like a, re a request that's been received. Uh, some rules and some information that might be helpful for that particular uh, request. Whereas the uh, if you go read the documentation about the context package, uh, request scoped rules and values. Uh, one of the the primary thing it's used for is to set rules on terms of like how long a process can run before it's uh like automatically canceled and that's what i'm going to show you here right now so you'll notice i already have some code here uh we'll get to this top part here in a minute um but this is probably the more important part so i have this function here and you'll see it's taking in a context which is which is just uh now when you see this in another package you almost always see it as the first argument if they do use context, uh, but that's just because that's like the idiomatic way it's been like uh, designed to be used and like dictated to use is uh, if your function or your package is the term, and I believe the terminology is context aware, uh, it should always be the first argument in a function. Um, don't know why, that's just what they decided. And you'll see that it's returning a the read-only side of a channel uh, that has in, in, in integers in it. And so what we're doing is we're making said channel, uh, initializing a variable, and then I'm starting a go routine that's going to loop over this indefinitely and attempt to write out to this channel the current value of that i variable and then increment the i variable, and then I just return. Now, if we go up here where I'm making use of it, you notice, I'll, okay, I'm, I'm creating this thing called um, a background context. Uh, the way contexts are used is as you get to the next step of a process, typically you create like a new instance of a context based on a parent context and then pass in that new like child version of the context. This creates like this kind of like chain of ownership of contexts. And this will be important for when we're doing the uh, the timeout uh, the timeout stuff. And you'll see that I am um, ranging over the channel returned from the generate function, and I'm just printing out what I got. And when I get to ten, I stop. Now this will work, and it'll exit, but it'll create a problem. This go routine never stops, and what'll happen is is we're actually creating a uh, we're leaking a go routine because this this will never stop so we have to tell it somehow to stop right so one of the ways we could do this is there's a, a a specific version of a context that we can create uh that has a way to manually cancel the context and uh, to make use of that, if I go back here, I think I just got rid of this. I can put it back here. Yeah. So we're putting this here, and we're going to be calling this method on the context called done. What done does is it returns a channel that um, you can make use of in your select statement. And if that channel has been closed, which will happen when the context is canceled for whatever reason, it will uh, go in this block of code and make the go routine stop. So how do we do that? So we have our, uh, our background context. Typically the background context is used as like your top level context that you use to start your, your chain of ownership. Um, so I wanna create the one that has some way of stopping it. So I'm gonna say context um, cancel uh, equals context with, uh, is it with cancel? Yeah. And you pass in the first argument is the context that you want the the parent context. So in this case, it's just context. Oops, that's not that's not how that works. Thank you. So what is cancel? Cancel is just a function. If you uh, invoke this function, it will cancel the context. Okay. So if I go down here, I'm after this loop is ended. I'm going to call this, and what will happen is this go routine will get thoroughly cleaned up. 
So it'll print from zero to 10. And then we have said that on 10, we are stopping the loop and then we cancel the reset. So that's fine, but we don't have any way of really noticing whether this context is actually closing, right? Uh, so let's just put, let's put a simple print statement here that says um, uh, stopping go routine, dot, 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 like that. And something you could do with context is when it's been, if, if, it's, if you notice it's been stopped is, you can actually find out why it was stopped by calling a method on the context called that's just called error. So I'm gonna say fnt print line ctx dot error like this. This will tell you why the context was canceled. Um, and if we go up here again, we're still not going to know this happens because this will probably finish before we ever see anything. So I'm just gonna put a simple sleep here for one. One knows it. One second. Time dot second like this. Uh, so now, if I run this, it should print out zero through ten, and then it'll call the cancel function to cancel our contacts, and then it should wait long enough for us to be able to see that that has actually happened. So we'll see, and you'll see that we had two messages print out. We see uh, stopping go routine and context canceled. You'll see that message context canceled if the function that was returned from like with deadline was actually invoked to say, hey, I am manually stopping this context. So that works fine for when you're, you're manually stopping it. But what if you wanted to automatically stop if it's just taking too long, for example? Well, there's another version of this we can do. And uh, to start off, I'm going to declare uh, uh, some, some duration, a specific, or I should say a specific uh, time. So I'm going to say time dot now uh, dot add, which is going to take whatever the current time is and then add some kind of time onto it. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to add on five milliseconds, like with like that. Uh, and instead of doing with cancel, I'm actually going to do, uh, with deadline. And the only difference with, with deadline is it has a second argument, which is the time that the context will automatically cancel whenever that time is reached. So I'm going to do this. Uh, now this will still execute way too fast. Um, as we'll see, if I run this, you'll still see it says context canceled. You'll get a different message if the context canceled because of uh, a timeout. So to simulate that, I'm going to add a sleep here to kind of indicate that this, maybe this process takes some kind of time. I'm going to do time.sleep of uh, one millisecond. And if we're doing this right, since each one of these iterations is taking one millisecond, it should get through about five of them, and then it'll basically automatically time itself out. So if I run this now, oops, I made a boo-boo. What did I make a boo-boo at? Oh, right. I need to, um, something else I probably should do is I'm going to actually close that channel when this happens. Uh, because otherwise it's going to still sit there waiting for data from the channel. Uh, let me run this. Okay, yeah. So we got through one to D four five. Uh, I guess it, it lasted a little longer. But you'll notice that this time it's still it says context deadline exceeded. That happens when the reason the context was canceled was because of an automatic timeout, not because it was manually canceled. There's a this from what I understand. This particular pattern of taking like the current time and adding a, uh, another time onto it for a deadline is so common that there's a there's a variation of with deadline that basically does this first part for you called with timeout. So what I'm going to do here instead is instead of saying with deadline, I'm going to say uh, with timeout. And instead of passing in D, I'm just going to pass in the five uh, time dot millisecond second like that get rid of this this is doing the exact same thing as i have before it's just doing the part where it's adding the time on to now behind the scenes also you'll notice i didn't mention this uh when you when you do with timeout or with deadline you still get a function that you can use to manually cancel the process if you want to uh, so if we run this this should still do the same thing yep it's still uh automatically timed itself out so that's the primary use case for context. Now there's another one, which is kind of, uh, I think it's kind of niche, which is you can put key value pairs on the context. Now, uh, a word of caution with the key value pairs is I've read about the context package is 
the 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 values that you attach to the context should only inform the the processes down the chain that are going to be using that context some more information about the current uh like environment the current context of, of everything that's happening so this would be something like um an ip address of whoever wherever the request came from uh you know whatever some kind of ram generated id that was generated for that particular request to do some something like tracing uh it's you you uh, you can use it for control, but I've seen it very strongly argued against. And what I mean by that is if you have some kind of section of your code that's making use of, say, like an if statement uh, based on some value from your context, that's that's very fragile and also kind of unstable because you have no idea what that value is. It could be what you expect it to be. It could be something else entirely. It's kind of, it's just... I would say it just seems like a bad idea. So to demonstrate that, uh, I'm going to kind of simulate the whole, like, oh, we have a request that had, like, a randomly generated ID and then use that ID to provide more information um, somewhere else. So to do that, I'm also going to demonstrate the whole context hierarchy thing here, too. I'm going to say uh, context equals context with value. And I'm going to pass in our parent context. And then the... Second argument is the key, and I'm going to say request ID. And then the second argument is the actual value. So I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five. And it's going to give me a warning saying, uh, should not use basic untyped int string as key, which, you know, uh, the example, I, a lot of the examples I saw, you do like, you create your own type that's based off a of string and use it. I'm not real sure why, but that's just what the suggestion is. So what does that give us? Now this gives us another context that spun off from the one that has a timeout, mind you, that has some kind of additional information attached to it. Now we can make use of this in our Go routine. So I'm going to say um, FMT um, print line uh, re re cancel, I can't it today. Request ID uh, CTX dot value uh, request ID. So what that's going to do is trying to Pull off of our context a uh, a value that's been assigned to this key if it exists. Um, now, because I uh, if if a if a higher level context cancels in the whole hierarchy, everything down below it cancels as well. It's kind of like a cascading effect. So even though that we're no longer passing in the context that was created from with timeout. This context actually still has the timeout, even though it, it's, it doesn't seem like it does. So if I run this, it'll still do the same thing. You'll notice it's still timed out because of deadline being exceeded. But now we also were able to give some additional information about that particular, uh, the particular uh, situation where this request, where this timeout occurred. Um, uh, that, that's it. That's basically what the context package is for. It's for controlling mostly timeouts and uh, adding some additional information to a quote request scoped um, uh, process. Uh, the reason why this is kind of very useful is it allows different package APIs that don't really know anything about each other to like pass along these type of information without having to like directly rely on each other. This is like if you go read the documentation, it, that's kind of the main reason that this was made was for like uh, cross API communication of additional information and, and um, timeout rules for long running process. Uh, that's all I got for y'all today. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, comment down below if you uh, have any other ideas about topics for me to cover. And with that, y'all come on back now and I'll see you next time.